am uh, an ex-linked Alport patient myself, a retired dialysis nurse. I'm on the board of directors for Alport Syndrome, and I'm happy to be here this afternoon, and we'll turn it over to Joanna. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Joanna Weinstock. I'm in Vermont, and uh, I'm going to ask Janine to go like this if I go on too long, because what I really have to talk about is a 73 year long journey, which included myself with X-Link Outport Syndrome and my children and my grandchildren. Um, everyone listening here today knows about Outport Syndrome, which is interesting because um, we know there are a lot of people who don't know they have it. And so we all probably remember the difficulties of getting a diagnosis. Even some of us who might have known that it was in our family. Um, I see on Facebook that there's still some problems getting the proper diagnosis. So for the first half of my life, I was totally innocent um, in the sense that I had never heard of Alport syndrome. So I wasn't scared or worried about it. But from the age of five, it was noted that I had protein and blood in my urine, which was believed to be due to having had a post-strep glomerulonephritis, which uh, followed a minor strep infection, which I remember was on my fifth birthday. Um, I didn't know it, but my parents were told I should probably never have children because they thought it might not be safe for me with my kidneys. Nobody ever made any um, thought that this could be a genetic problem that I could pass on to my kids. Uh, when I was uh, in my early 20s, I went to see a nephrologist who did a lot of tests. I realize now from um, my current perspective, he was probably looking for um, urinary problems, not so much in the kidney. And uh, he said, oh, it's okay, go ahead and have children. So I did, got married, had two kids. And then when my son was a baby, we started to notice that even on his diaper, there were, the urine was dark. So I mentioned it to our pediatrician who was a good pediatrician. And basically they said, oh, it just gets concentrated when he's sick. No, in fact, no one ever checked his urine until he was five. And this is pretty common today that children don't routinely get uh, their urine checked at a well child visit. And there was nothing else that would have prompted them to look for it. Uh, so then the next thing that happened, um, the hematuria in our son persisted. So he was referred to a urologist and he was put on antibiotics for almost two years because they thought they were treating infections. At the same time in routine hearing tests at the school, they started to notice that he had some hearing loss. So he was referred to um, an ENT doctor, ear, nose, and throat, who said, despite his testing, that the results were so inconsistent that it was a behavioral problem. Uh, I just want people to realize if you are getting your children tested, that used to be um, pretty common that children would be diagnosed with behavioral problems. I hope that's not true anymore, but it's something to keep in mind. So he, they wanted him to see us, um, a psychologist about his behavior. And when I asked him, well, with, with hearing loss that's so bad, how do you do well in school? He said, because the teachers shout. Okay, so um, in summary, we saw five types of specialists over about 35 years, and none of them connected the dots. And we didn't have the internet then or Dr. Google to bail us out. So now looking back on my current perspective, which is as a family physician, I became a doctor when my children were already in their um, 20s. I can see that while some of our experiences were due to what would now be considered bad medicine, like the too many antibiotics, and some were due to medical arrogance of doctors not listening um, to the patients or the pa parents, um, most of them were just due to ignorance, innocent ignorance, I guess, about this very rare disease. And it takes a unique combination of a doctor with up-to-date ex expertise. I was just, it was, my heart was just warmed by hearing Dr. Wardy and wishing that we could all fall into the hands of a doctor like that at the very beginning to help us and help our children. Um, so one of the things those of us who were involved with the Alport Syndrome Foundation really are trying to figure out is how to get the word out, how to educate doctors and other caregivers, and um, the big role that families have to play in, in doing that. When I was in medical school, I don't think that I ever saw the word Alport listed more than once on a, on a sheet with 20 other diseases. And um, it was, there was a lot of um, 
air, you know, like women were carriers and it was just X-linked. Okay, so um, I'm gonna hang, stop now so everybody else can have a chance to talk. Thanks so much, Joanna. Grant, I saw you not, um, nodding your head over there. Any of that sound familiar to you? Tell us about your story. Uh, I'd say about 90% of that sound familiar with the diagnosis part. Um, for me, uh, ever since I was born, uh, my mom and my dad knew, the doctors told us that I had protein in my urine. My mom knew that she had some sort of kidney disease. She'd been misdiagnosed for around 50 years, we found out when I was in about freshman year, so when I was around 15. But for me, that we didn't do anything about it until you know we found that I had Alports. Um, I found out because in fifth grade, we just had a district hearing test. And that district hearing test went completely wrong. Nothing went right. Um, I sat, you know, they do the whole push the button when you hear a beep thing. I sat in that room for probably 10 minutes and never pushed that button. And the person giving me the hearing test just blamed it on, oh, there's a loud fan in the background. We'll test you again next year. So she wrote me a note. She said, bring this home to your parents so they know to test you again next year. I took that note right to my mom and I was like, um, uh, you guys, you know, you know how you make fun of me when I'm reading and I don't hear you guys? Well, uh, it turns out <laughs> it might not just be that I'm so focused that I can't hear you, I might actually have hearing loss. So we took that note, we went to an audiologist immediately, and we got my hearing tested professionally. Since then, I've been wearing hearing aids, uh, and that was my summer going into sixth grade. And immediately my mom searched up on the internet, she goes, well, just on a hunch, let me see, hearing loss and kidney disease. First thing that came up was outboard syndrome. She went right to the outboard syndrome foundation website and got in touch with Sharon Lagos, who had you know, started the foundation, obviously. So I went to my first family meeting a year after that when I was going into eighth grade. And that family meeting absolutely changed my life. Um, from there on, I stayed involved and I've met you know, so many amazing people, including Kevin Schnur, actually, who's currently on this call. But at that meeting, that, that was my first experience with advocating and sharing my voice. Um, at that meeting, I, I met my first patients and there was only one other kid in that room with hearing loss. So we shared our stories a lot and we were so happy to find someone else that not only had you know, the same kidney disease, but hearing loss. And that was huge for me because my life if I'd been completely turned upside down. So meeting all these other kids was absolutely life-changing. You know, I finally had hope again. You know, I didn't feel so alone. And that's the point of these meetings, to not feel alone. Um, but I actually ended up telling Kevin. Kevin came to me, a 12-year-old at the time, said, so do you really think I should get hearing aids? He'd known he had hearing loss for a few years and hadn't worn hearing aids yet. And little 12-year-old me went off on a whole rant about how amazing hearing aids are and how you should really get your hearing aids because they're so helpful um, I noticed a huge change in school as soon as I started wearing them. And obviously he was out of college at this point. He was a full on adult living on his own, the whole thing, which I was terrified of at the time, but I wasn't terrified to tell him that he was not being smart by not wearing hearing aids. Um, <laughs> was not afraid to voice my opinion on that. And it was that, you know, it was that experience that brought me to advocating for Alport syndrome in general. Uh, I go to you know, National Kidney Foundation meetings once a year and advocate on Capitol Hill. I went to my first uh, Every Life Foundation for Rare Disease Advocation, um, Advocation Week on Capitol Hill this year, too. Uh, you know, I try to do my best to have, you know, everyone else's voice heard because it is a rare disease. So, you know, it's tough to get the voice out there if it's not that well known. Well known. So, you know, outboard syndrome has brought me to where I am today. And as of now, I'm, you know, very healthy. I'm on a study trial that my mom's also on that's helped us a ton. And again, I just like to thank, you know, Alpha syndrome for bringing these family meetings together because they're so huge. They're so helpful. Um, luckily, I've had a good nephrologist this entire time. She's been so helpful. And, you know, she's like family to us now. She's been there at all my low points. She's helped me so much through, you know, my teenage years, especially, which are tough for most people, but when you find out you have a rare disease, you know, that doesn't help, obviously. You already feel different than all of your peers, but she's been, you know, a huge help. She's been a great listener, and she's helped me with all my medications. So, you know, and that's not everyone's story, though. So that's why you need to be able to, you know, have other people around you to help you out. And that's what Albert Syndrome Foundation has done for me and my family. All right. Thanks I so much, Grant. Catherine, 
Can you tell us your story? Yeah, thanks, Janine. Um, it's uh, kind of hard to follow <laughs> Joanna and Grant uh, where they have so much to say and such great stories. Um, so I'm Catherine McKernan. I'm a speech language pathologist. I live in San Diego, California. And um, my, I guess my all port syndrome story kind of, as many of us, we have a lot of relatives with all port syndrome. Um, so my father um, had a kidney transplant um, from a living donor from his brother when my mother was pregnant with me. And his brother had had a kidney transplant from a cadaver donor um, previous to that. And when they both had gone into kidney failure, that was when the family first started hearing Alport syndrome. Um, but it wasn't until my generation um, began to get affected by the kidney failure when my cousin went into kidney failure and had a transplant um, from a living donor that it was kind of more confirmed, but we never had genetic testing. Um, we just heard that because then also my father and his brother had hearing loss, that it was probably Alport syndrome. Um, me, so I'm one of uh, three girls and my sisters and I all have microscopic hematuria, um, but we were never followed by nephrology because we were told we were just carriers. And fast forward to where we are today, um, we are now being followed by nephrology. We've been working with a nephrologist to kind of share the message that female, females with X-linked Allport syndrome aren't just carriers, that we actually have the disease um, and be sure that we stay healthy. And we're kind of working through it as a family. And my sisters and I have been also looking into um, IVF for when we're ready to have children to um, try to make sure that we don't pass on Allport to our children as well. Thank you, Catherine. And Adam, tell us your story. Absolutely, Janine, thank you. Uh, so my name is Adam Jardine. Uh, I'm a 30 year old Alport patient currently in about stage 3B. Uh, my story probably mirrors a lot of what you've heard and a lot of what a lot of you have experienced already. Uh, I had protein and blood in my urine at, at a young age, you know, probably two, three years old. Uh, and I was diagnosed with familial nephritis. Uh, I, and I'm not a doctor, but I take that just to essentially mean that a uh, family history of kidney disease. That's all that we really knew about it at the time. Uh, and a lot like Grant, uh, a lot of like other of you, uh, I started to experience hearing loss my early teenage years. Uh, to be honest, I didn't even realize that, you know, I, I realized that I couldn't hear things the way that, you know, I used to be able to, too. I realized in class that I wasn't hearing the teacher with conversations. I was turning the TV way up, but I, you know, I, I didn't seek anything out because I didn't realize that's what it was till finally I, I got a hearing test uh, and it had, you know, your classic outboard curve. And as soon as I got that hearing test back, my doctor was able to, to add, you know, two plus two. Yep. That's definitely outboard syndrome. Got a, got a biopsy, uh, confirmed Alport syndrome. Uh, and then since that time, uh, I, I went on, uh, went, went to school, went to law school at Michigan, uh, started working as uh, a corporate attorney in Milwaukee in real estate. And that's when I started to get more involved uh, in the kidney community. I started working with our, our local Wisconsin chapter, the Natural Kidney Foundation of Wisconsin became a board member uh, and then became involved in the National Association, met people like Grant, uh, Andre Wansock, Lisa, Kevin, met all those people at our Capitol Hill days and just absolutely loved advocating uh, and realized it's something that I wanted to do more of uh, and actually just recently changed my career. Uh, I now work in healthcare policy on Capitol Hill, work on some organ donation issues uh, and, and really found that, you know, advocating uh, made myself happier and being able to you know, take, you know, what I originally saw as a problem and, and grab a hold of it and, and really advocate for myself and everybody else out there. Thank you, Adam. We can move into um, questions from the participants. And we'll start with um, a thank you from Alport Foundation 
founder Sharon, to everyone that's here today, um, to the panelists. We have a question or a concern from someone asking about um, genetics. And so if any of you, the genetic testing and the accuracy and symptoms versus genetic testing results. So I know that none of you are the expert geneticists, but you have experiences with genetic testing that you might want to share? Should I start? Absolutely, go right ahead. Any of you jump in. Well, this is one of the first um, things that happened. I, I used to be a medical librarian, and so I was able to do some uh, research. And I think this was in the 80s. I found out that there was a group at the University of Utah that was looking for people who had Alport syndrome. By then, we had just had a diagnosis. And uh, it turns out it was Dr. Curtis Atkin and Dr. Martin Gregory. And um, I didn't know it at the time. Curtis Atkin is a P was a PhD who himself had Alport syndrome and had been working on discovering the gene on um, the, X, the X chromosome. And so uh, I just can't tell you how much it meant to me, first of all, to know that there was somebody else in the world who had Alport syndrome and somebody was working on it. And they found out that we had a mutation and that matched a mutation from a family in Denmark, who I will probably never know. But it turns out it's not that simple. There's million, you know, thousands of different mutations and probably almost every family has a different mutation. So when I took part in the Athena study, they um, did my genetic testing as part of it. And it turns out I have three mutations. So the question is, how do you, where do where you get tested? There's so many different ways of testing. It's really comp complex, but the, the genetic testing is getting simpler. Um, I think it might be helpful if you had known what mutation you had to go in and really uh, define it. But um, it's hard to keep up because the science is changing so much. I think if we look on Joy, um, Joy Tull wrote a good answer to somebody last week on Facebook. And um, she was really explaining, you, you, can, you can still possibly have a um, false negative test. So you think you're negative and you're not. So as a physician, Joanna, certainly it, it leans back to the need for not looking just at one test result, but looking at the whole patient. Yeah. And I think, you know, as a doctor, I'm rusty. I haven't, I haven't kept up with the, the rapid changes. I, I think the thing would be to try to get a referral to a genetic, geneticist who could help you figure out the best test for your situation. Um, Grant or Catherine, Adam, your experience with genetic testing? Yeah, I, I recently uh, did the, the free Invitate uh, testing. Uh, my doctor wasn't, my nephrologist wasn't aware of it at the time, uh, but, you know, heard about it through the ASF community. I brought it up to my doctor. He filled out the form. Uh, it was super easy. I just went in, got my, uh, I think it was just the blood test, got my results back within a few weeks. Uh, and it, oh, go Adam, ahead. Yeah. Could you name that again, please? Invitae? Invitae, yep. In Vitae, yep, it was free genetic testing. Just mentioned it to my doctor. Uh, he did all the paperwork, found out the results in a few weeks, found out that the one that the mutation that I had was never reported for. Uh, so I like to say that I'm one of a kind, uh, just as a little bit of a joke. Uh, but yeah, it, it's good to know exactly what mutation that you have and be able to confirm it through the genetic testing. Catherine or Grant? Yeah, I know Grant had something to add, but I did want to follow up Adam with the genetic testing. So um, in Vitae, I think they're doing the genetic testing right now that's free for Alport syndrome. My sister, one of my sisters was able to get it done. Um, and I believe that the process was fairly easy with her doctor. Um, I've had a really difficult time getting it done. The doctors, I've seen two different doctors. I saw my primary care physician 
and my nephrologist and asked both of them if I could get it done. Um, and I got a lot of pushback from both of them. My, my nephrologist was saying he was particularly worried about the cost of it for me and didn't believe me that it was free. Um, and also said I didn't need a genetic test since um, my cousin and both of my sisters have genetic tests with our mutation. Um, so I'm still going to try to get it done. I'm not giving up, but, um, for anybody who's had an experience, cause I'm, I'm kind of active on the Facebook group too. And I've seen a lot of people who are like, this is so easy and simple. And it has not been easy and simple for me. Um, so I think it really depends on your particular situation, your, um, your doctors and kind of their knowledge of this type of thing. But as a patient, you just have to keep advocating for yourself, even if it takes a little bit of time and, um, a little bit of pestering your doctor to get the testing done. And again, the the company is in Vitae, but the name of the test is called Kidney Code. So any of you looking for that online in Vitae, Kidney Code is what you'd be looking for. And it is indeed right now no cost. Grant, you wanted to pop in with something about genetic uh, I'd say most of it was probably covered at the this point, um, I was going to mention kidney code, of course. Uh, it is, you know, just saying genetic testing is very important, especially now that it's free. Um, I, you know, because of my study trial, my mom and I both had to take it, or me, I had to take it first, um, before my mom was even on the study trial. And without the genetic testing, my mom never would have figured out, she, we had assumed that she was, you know, my carrier for, you know, the reason why I had it, but she'd been misdiagnosed all of her life. So once she took the, she actually got the genetic testing and found out that she had Alport's, it just cleared so many things up and, you know, it would, you know, brought us to where we are today. And, you know, we're still trying to get all of our extended family and all that to get them tested. My brothers got tested using the free kidney code. Um, and so now we know for sure that he is clean. You know, he doesn't have Alport syndrome by any means, no x link, no carrier, no nothing. And, you know, I don't have a ton of experience with it because by biopsy we found out right away that I do have outports, but everyone else around me has taken it. And it's very important to make sure that you do get tested if you know, you're not a hundred percent sure, or, you know, you don't know if your family members for sure have it or not. Um, you know, especially now that it's free and it's out there, it's great to just advocate for yourself. Uh, like Catherine was saying, it's very important. So, you know, just keep advocating for yourself no matter what happens because it's, you know, it's very important now. It's very doable and very possible. Thank you. Um, uh, the next question will go to Adam, please, um, related to your work in healthcare policy. Um, are you seeing more widespread changes on Capitol Hill supporting the intersections of kidney disease, wellness, and socioeconomic factors? And what's being done to ensure that we continue to encourage person first or holistic care? Yeah, it's a terrific question. Uh, definitely seeing changes. Uh, I would say a lot more is being focused on the mental health care side and also telehealth. Uh, we're trying to move a, a lot in that direction where you know it's a lot easier to be able to talk to a therapist, have it covered. Uh, there's obviously the, the Parity Act, which requires insurance companies to treat mental health the same as they do uh, physical health problems. So we are seeing a lot of work being done there. On the holistic side, th th that's difficult uh, just because that requires widespread changes, I would say, and bills tend to be a little bit more specific. Uh, but I, I do see a lot of work being done in, in the healthcare field, which is good, and things will hopefully also move a lot quicker uh, starting next year. And I thank you, Jess, for that question. It was, it was a really good one. Thank you. Um, can um, each of you, any of you, um, address how you approach receiving, getting uh, emotional support for what you go through? Uh, um, I guess I could start with that one. Um, I, you know, as a, you know, being diagnosed as a teen, um, I'd say most teens kind of 
kind of go into themselves when they're first diagnosed. They try to internally process it. And, it, you know, it's tough. It's a hard thing to process at first. And it's hard to open up about, you know, how it's affected you. You know, as a teen, you just want to fit in with everyone else. And you just want, you know, you want to make sure that everything's going smooth in your life. So that's not, you know, it's not that easy to accomplish that. You know, when you get diagnosed, a lot of things change in your life. But once you do open up, uh, I originally just started opening up with my family. Luckily, my family and I have a very open relationship. And, you know, especially since my mom was for sure, you know, she for sure found out that she had Alport syndrome. It's another connection that, you know, makes our relationship that much deeper. Um, as much as it is hard to admit that you have a rare disease, it doesn't, doesn't make your life too much deeper. You know, too different. It's part of you, and you know, accepting that can be hard. But once you do, it makes your life so much easier. Um, I'd say for about the first year and a half, almost two years, I had a very hard time accepting that. But once I opened up to my family, my brother was a huge help. My older brother Mac, um, you know, made us closer too. The hard part is letting in your friends because you don't want to and. Again, I'm mostly just adjusting, you know, addressing the younger audience here because I am the younger audience right now. But, you know, opening up to other people in your life is tough because you don't want them to see you differently. Um, but whether or not it changes your relationship with them, it frees you of the burden of hiding it and, you know, hiding your true self because holding it in does not help. So emotionally, you have to you know, get to the point where you have someone of the support system, whether it's your family. I saw a therapist too, uh, eventually when I was 15, I believe. So any way that you can open up to anyone and you feel safe, then it helps a lot. Opening up by any means can help a huge amount. You know, just being able to free yourself is the point because even though it is a rare disease and there, you know, it may not seem like there's a lot of us out there, there are currently 139 people <laughs> listening to this right now. So just that right there should tell you that there are other people out there who are willing to listen and help if needed. So accepting that is the hardest part, but it makes everything easier. I agree with every, everything Grant said, and I'm so glad that we talk more about mental health now. Study after study has shown that people with chronic, with chronic conditions, including chronic kidney disease, suffer at, at much greater rates of depression, anxiety, uh, and mental health issues. Now, we just encourage everyone to, you know, find ways to find the best way for you to express yourself. I you know I struggled with that when I was a young kid, you know, I felt like I didn't have anybody to talk to, you know, none of my friends were experiencing this. You know, my family didn't experience it at, at, at the same level. Only my mom had it. Uh, she had it to a much lesser degree. Uh, didn't really talk about hearing loss, those sorts of things. But there are lots of avenues to which you can do it. I mean, you can talk with family members, uh, you can see a therapist, talk with them about it. Uh, you can advocate, you know, that's one of my favorite ways to be able to express my feelings and it's helped a ton. So, you know, just find what, what you're comfortable with and, and go for it. Um, Catherine, any thoughts? Yeah, so I think it's, I think my perspective is a little bit different because um, I still just have microscopic hematuria and I'm not anticipating that I'll go into kind of a chronic kidney disease anytime soon. Um, although I know it's possible, but for me, I think one of the biggest emotional difficulties with my family has been the hearing loss um, that my, my father has had a progressive hearing loss um, that has worsened from kind of a moderate hearing loss when I was a child to now severe profound hearing loss. Um, and that's impacted our family emotionally a lot because it's, it can make it really hard for us to communicate effectively. Um, and yeah, so, I mean, I would say for us, one of the biggest things is being able to, like um, Grant and Adam were saying, to be able to talk about um, how frustrating the hearing loss is and um, as the hearing technology has improved to be able to use some of the technology and our knowledge about hearing loss to, I guess, lessen the impact as much as we can. Um, but I think that that's been a big, a big emotional stressor on my family. 
And that leads nicely into another question, and that is, how are any of you coping with your hearing loss in this day and age of wearing masks um, and social distancing? Uh, lip reading is a little tough right now, isn't it? Yes. Yeah, yes. please, any of you, jump right in. Um, I have I hearing didn't. aids, but I didn't, re I didn't realize how much I still depend on lips. Yeah, I didn't, um, I've noticed it. Uh, I'd say I noticed it about two years ago with my family that, you know, whether or not I practice lip reading at all or anything like that, naturally I look at people's lips just as extra support. And I didn't really think about that for a while. Uh, I just naturally ended up doing it. And I'd say that with the masks, it's, it's another avenue for you to, you know, depending on who you're talking to, say, hey, you know, real quick, because, you know, asking someone to repeat themselves numerous times can get a little embarrassing. Mm -hmm. But I'd say the people that, you know, I have told, like, hey, like, I've got hearing loss. Could you just speak up a little louder, anything? It's not that embarrassing, you know. No one takes it badly. No one's like, oh, that's weird. Like, why would you open up to me about that? Or it's never negative. People want to help. Um, you know, especially, um, I, you know, with, you know, like Catherine was saying, hearing aid technology has gotten so much better. Um, luckily, you know, I've got hearing aids that have, you know, that connect to my phone. I've got an app on my phone where I can change the setting on my hearing aid. Turning the volume up and down is really clear still. It's, you know, there are so many options out there now and, you know, it's only getting better. So, you know, really, as long as you are open to letting other people know so that they can help you, because asking for help is not always easy, but once you do, other people are willing to help. Um, I'm shocked still, you know, how many people are willing to help, you know, once I just say, hey, I've got hearing loss, can you speak up a little bit? Everyone's always willing to help. So, that, you know, knowing that alone, makes everything so much easier yeah, you, you often don't realize how much you you look for other physical cues when you have a hearing loss whether that's lip reading that's body language there is a lot that goes into just hearing when you have hearing loss and that's a big reason why studies have shown that people with hearing loss often experience fatigue because it, you spend a lot of energy just to try and listen to people so it, with masks, it's obviously difficult. I pretty much, I've, what I've done is I pretty much don't go anywhere without my hearing aids, you know, before, you know, just going to the corner store. It, it wouldn't be that big of a deal if I didn't wear my hearing aids because I could still talk with people. I could still, you know, realize what they're saying in, in small, small environments. Uh, but w now with masks, obviously I just have to wear my hearing aids everywhere. Our, our grandson is is Ken and um, has hearing aids, but also the school has set up a system where the teacher has some kind of device and the, all the, so all the kids in the class can hear her clearly. Um, but he has this thing that he wears around his neck um, and they have a um, person who comes in every two weeks and until the coronavirus and taught them sign language. So we'll see how things go because now with masks, that's going to make a difference even if they do start school again. Have um, again because of mask wearing brings us to a question about COVID-19 and what um, strategies are you using in your own lives to um, decrease the risk of exposure? Yeah, I'll take that one. Uh, so I'm sure a lot of people have seen that people with advanced stages of kidney disease are at more risk for complications. I, I think like all things, this is a, a balancing approach. You have to understand where you are at, you know, if you're early stages or, or later stages, uh, you know, take, taking the necessary precautions, you know, I, I still have to do things. I still have to go to the grocery store. Uh, I still have to do things for myself, you know, we, we, we go out to, to the national park go on some trails, uh, but, you know, you still have to be realistic about it and you know, wear masks, keep socially distanced. 
Uh, you know, I remember, you know, back in 2009, uh, when H1N1 w- was a big deal, I, I caught that and that was extraordinarily scary, was, got terribly sick from that. So it definitely is real. And, you know, you just have to be realistic of, about where you're at and, and take the, those necessary precautions. Yeah, I'd say it's all about the precautions. I mean, even as, you know, a young person, I, you know, I'm still aware that I have rare disease and I'm um, you know, knowing that I'm less at risk to get it still, it's, you know, it's scary to know it's out there, but, you know, I always bring extra gloves. I, I put gloves and masks in, in my car so that even if I forget to bring my main mask, um, I've always got a mask wherever I go. Um, I, you know, obviously I social distance, you know, whether I'm going to a store or not, I always put on gloves just to make sure. And it may, you know, it may seem kind of weird because not everyone else is wearing gloves, but I'd rather be on the safe side, obviously. Uh, my family's been really careful too at the very beginning and still continuing. Whenever someone went outside for you know a period of time, we'd come in, immediately change our clothes, you know, wash all of them, take a shower, the whole thing. I mean, we tried desanitizing everything um, or sanitizing everything, and just the small precautions, just to you know, even helping your you know mentally thinking that you're you know safer than you are, help a ton. Um, you know, you can only do so much, but Gloves, mask, you know, showering, the whole thing, it helps. Hmm. Catherine, is there anything you'd like to add? No, I think, I think Adam and Grant did a nice job answering that. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Um, have any of you experienced any of the eye abnormalities that go along with Alport syndrome. I'm being followed for macular thinning and have gotten flat retinopathy. Uh, I haven't, but um, when my son was a teenager, he kept getting uh, corneal erosions. They're very painful. And they really never made any connection to it being related to Alport syndrome. But I suspect it, it may be because um, there is a basement membrane in the cornea of the eye. And um, I'm, I don't, I wonder if other people had that problem. I haven't run into the eye abnormalities. You know, I, I wear glasses for long distance. And then when I'm on a computer, just to protect my eyes a little bit. Uh, but it's mostly just likely just involved. The reason why I wear eyeglasses is because you know, as I get older and being in front of the computer so much. We have another question on uh, medications. What medications do you take? And do you experience any side effects from that? And I'd like to throw this one at Grant <laughs> because I remember when early on when we first met, that was one thing your mom had talked about, some difficulties you had with um, your medications. Yeah, that's, I'd say that's experienced by a good amount of, you know, you know newly diagnosed people too. Um, a lot's changed, but I'll start, you know, kind of from the beginning. Um, I started with lisinopril and losartan, and, you know, I naturally have low blood pressure, and both of those medications lower your blood pressure. So I was getting to the point, and I was a very active kid, you know, I was playing three different sports at the time, um, and I couldn't, you know, those medications lowered my blood pressure to the point. I think my final, by the time, when I got off them, I think my latest blood pressure is around 63 over 52 or something like that. So um, I think my doctor said I had the blood pressure of a five-year-old. <laughs> so I was, you know, I was constantly fatigued, you know, any exercise, I pretty much passed out. My life changed completely, couldn't play any more sports. And I must have tried at least 12 different variations between the two drugs to try and combat, you know, how little I could take where I was still helping my kidneys and, still being able to live a life. And that's how I got really close with my nephrologist too, because I was very open with her. And I was saying, you know, after, you know, we try a certain dosage, then after a week, I'd say, here's what happened. And we worked really closely together trying to figure out the best dosage possible. But it was really tough at that time because as, you know, as a teenager, my body was, you know, you hear it a lot. Your body's changing a lot. I was growing. I was you know, trying to live my life differently. I was at school longer and I had more homework. I was more stressed. All of those factors came into play. So it was very hard to find, you know, the correct dosage. 
luck, I mean, luckily I got on the study trial and that went, you know, it's going so well. It went so well that I was able to get off those drugs, but I'd say it's pretty common for people who are taking, you know, ACE and ARBs like Clostartan and Lisinopril to experience fatigue. I'd say that about 80% of the teens that I've talked to at all the family meetings, they all say the same thing. They're very fatigued. They, you know, they pass out a good, a good amount and it is scary. So I'd say that as long as you're open with your nephrologist, that's what helps the most because they want to make sure that you can still live your life and help your kidneys at the same time. So that's what helped my mental stability as well, being, able to, you know, being open with my nephrologist. Catherine, I see you nodding. Do you, can you add to that? Have you had trouble with medication? No, I haven't had trouble with medication, but it's been interesting, like, to hear Grant's perspective as a young person with Alport syndrome, and then to hear my father's perspective, who's in his um, mid-60s, and, um, you know, like I said earlier, he was the recipient of a transplant 33 years ago, and he's been on medication um, for the last 33 years, and he's now experiencing a lot of side effects from the medication um, that it's making it really difficult to make a change because the kidney has been so successful for him. Um, there's, there's fear about changing medication. Um, and so that's been something that I know that he's been working through. So it's interesting to hear Grant's perspective at like the other end of life, I guess. <laughs> so we have just a couple of minutes left and, um, uh, we've tried to bring um, the questions forward as they've come in. Uh, and if we didn't get to yours, then we'll find other ways to address those questions, either through a pre-recorded session or through um, an additional webinar. Um, we also can email or message you directly. Um, so I'm keeping track of a couple of names in particular where you have a scope of questions that um, we might be able to address in more detail. So to close from our group, uh, I'd like you each to just comment on this question. Do you find that having Alport syndrome shapes how you think about your future in any particular way? <laughs> uh, I guess I could start with that one because I'm at the younger end of this perspective. <laughs> um, I would say that it definitely has, but I'd say it's more positive now than it ever has been. Uh, like I said before, you know, I advocate a good amount and it's shown me, you know, my interests and my passion starting in seventh, eighth grade. So, you know, looking at my future, you know, having the hope of, you know, great hearing aid technology and medications, it makes me feel safer knowing that whatever I go into, uh, I'll be, you know, everything will work out because I feel safe, you know, with my life now. Obviously, since I'm off those other medications, my quality of life is so much better and I feel, you know, the, you know I have so many more options in the world. But since learning about Port Syndrome and since I told Kevin to go wear his hearing aids and stop being an idiot about that because hearing aids do help you a lot, <laughs> um, I've learned a lot about myself. And, you know, once you realize that something about yourself is different than say your peers. And once your life changes that much, you have to, you have to look at yourself from a different perspective in order to get over it. And being, you know, spending so much time to think about that is huge. So I'd say that my, you know, my future is, it's so much brighter and I can, you know, I have a much more narrow perspective on what I think I want to do because I'm able to help so many other people. Yeah, I'll, I'll say, I, I'm an Alport's patient, and I know that, you know, within the next five years or so, uh, I'm definitely going to have to have a transplant or dialysis. I know that's part of my future, but I'm not defined by Alport syndrome. When I go up and meet somebody, I don't shake somebody's hand and say, you know, my name's Adam. I'm an Alport syndrome patient. It's not doesn't define who I am. So yes, I absolutely think about it when I'm making decisions. Uh, you know, I think about, you know, cut out of alcohol for my life. Uh, you know, I want to make sure that I prepared for when it does happen. But at the same time, you know, I have to be able to experience life and I have to be able to go after my goals and my dreams. So I'm, I'm not going to let it limit 
uh, limited to what I can do. If I want to go skiing, I'm going to go skiing. If I want to take a risk on my career, I'm, I'm going to do that. So it's important to, to definitely have the perspective about it and, and to think about it, but it doesn't define who you are.